is largely, and, and I, I consider myself a godly man, not necessarily a religious man. You believe, right? I, yes, I do. I believe that Jesus resurrected from the dead. I, I'm not uh, of the opinion that he is our Lord and Savior. And I, I, don't, I say this not to offend people, I, but I believe that from in the, my research into the original religion of Jesus, that he was talking about every individual is in the process of becoming a Christ-like being. That is the purpose of our earthly existence, is to embrace our highest selves and to awaken this consciousness. When Jesus is saying, follow me, he's saying, be like me, do what I do. In fact, he said, we will do these things and even greater things. He sounds like he's coming out of the priesthood of Enki, and I believe he was, as a matter of fact. So when I'm talking about religion, I, I see religion as a controlling force, as a force that is trying to keep us locked in place. And I, I'm thinking all religions are like this. This is why we see so much conflict between the religions, especially in our present day. Buddhism, excuse me, uh, Islam and, and Christianity are literally, we're talking about racing towards the apocalypse because of religious beliefs, not spiritual beliefs. And when you, you step into the realm of religion, you're talking into the, of the realm of dogma, and dogma is law. And if you don't subscribe to the law, you're an outlaw. And now this is where you have problems, and this has been the source of, of the wars. I mean, we talked about St. Francis. My God, he, he had to go deal with, the, with what I call the Nazi Pope, Pope Innocent III, who sent 30,000 stormtroopers into the Languedoc of southern France and exterminated as many as one million men, women, and children Cathars because they believed and professed that they possessed the original true religion of Jesus. So why is the Pope going after the Cathars to eradicate this high spiritual teaching? The answer is control. It's all about control, isn't it's it? It's all about control. It always has been, always will be. Exactly. So we get these stories that say, oh, you know, how dare you think that you can somehow transform yourself into one of these glorious beings? How how dare you believe that you can transform yourself into a being of light? And after a while, people simply believe that they can't and don't pursue that path. And that's, that's the trap. That's the whole, that's the whole uh, wall that we're up against here that we're trying to scale at this present time is to overcome that. Let's get into 2012 if we can. What do you think is going to happen, William? Well, first of all, <clears throat> we're in it now. It's, it's already unfolding. And at the highest level, I see the manifestation of these beings. I mean, I am seriously tracking this Mayan symbolism that describes this alignment in 2012 as a sacred tree, as a cosmic tree. It's an energetic event is the key thing that this imagery of the sacred tree suggests to us, that there's going to be a, a two-way energy exchange. And I think that things can really heat up on this planet energetically, and that there, will, there could be a, a, a tremendous falling away of people that simply cannot handle this higher energy. And what I encourage people to do is right now to, the, the ancient term that they used is to live righteously, to speak truth, to speak your truth, and to recognize that we're in alignment right now with the throne of God. And I, I recommend or suggest that people behave that way. And if you are behaving that way, you're going to be operating out of your highest self and I think you're going to be more fully protected, uh, of course, than if you're not. And so that, that's what I'm seeing here, George, is that 2012 is a, an energetic event, event. I think we're going to be seeing um, higher energy coming from the center of the galaxy that, that could be detrimental to quite a few people. But, but you do see it as an event of importance and uh, of such a magnitude that... Uh... It's not going to destroy the planet. No, I don't see cataclysmic earth changes, but I do see a scenario. I mean, I see a scenario. I mean, based on the, the Christian prophecy of the return of Christ, they talk about above the cross of crucifixion, the sacred tree of crucifixion was an inscription that read Inri. It's, traditionally, that's interpreted as Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It was a placard put there by Pontius Pilate. From the very beginning, the esoteric tradition has said, no, what that means is by fire, frequency, or vibration, humankind 
is made holy or whole. But the problem is, is that this energy, this Christos energy, this Inri energy, is so high that unless you're prepared to, to receive that energy, it's going to be like putting your finger in a light socket or walking into a blender. You're, you're going to get your feathers ruffled. And the message that has always gone along with this Inri message is <clears throat> we have to raise our vibration. We have to eat better. We have to think better. And we have to do better things. Well... And there's no doubt about that. Upcoming events for you. You're going to be at Conscious Life in Los Angeles in February. I'll Can't be wait. there too. Yeah, mm-hmm. we'll, get to, we'll get together again. And what? Tell me about the Soul Rising event in Nashville. I have a. <clears throat> excuse me. Every spring. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm sorry, George. Sure. Every spring I have an, an event here in Nashville, <clears throat> where it's I. A, I it is a great, a great event too, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, and this year <clears throat> it's focused on my Soul Rising material all new information focusing on the seraphim and <clears throat> how we raise our vibration. And also, of course, uh, William has events uh, in Egypt. Uh, that's where you met Claire. Yes. You're, gonna, you're going back. Uh, when is that? In January, January 17th through February 2nd. We've got a couple seats available. Last-minute uh, sign-ups can come over to williamhenry.net, get information, and, and join us. It truly is the trip of a lifetime. And it's safe to go to Egypt these days, right? Egypt is perfectly safe. It's, uh, in fact, they, they embrace people from the West. They're very, very open-hearted people, and it's, to me, one of the safest. Well, we've got William Henry, and we've got you this hour. We're going to take phone calls with William Henry in a moment right here on Coast to Coast AM. Hey, William, when you were a little boy, were you were you interested in this kind of material? No, I wasn't. You know, I grew up in the Detroit area. My whole emphasis, my focus was on sports and music. I played a lot of baseball, a lot of football, played a lot of guitar. and uh, But then, you know, it was kind of funny because... Um, when I was in my 30s, I came home one day with a piece of moldavite, this uh, this rock. They call it the windshield of a UFO because it's green and you can see through it. It was actually from a meteorite that, ah. that, that crashed in Moldavia. My mom asked, is that from Idaho? And I said, no, no, it's from Moldavia. Why do you ask? And she said, well, don't you remember when you were 10 or so, we went out to the Craters of the Moon National Park and you, you made your father pull over so you could go stand out in the middle of this volcanic field. And we, were just, we looked at, that, at you at that moment going, you know, what's up with our kid? Why does he want to go out and stand out in the middle of this volcano? And so, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things. But, no, growing up, it was, uh, it was all about sports and music for me. When did you leave Detroit? What year? I left in 1982. You left in 82. I left in 78. I went uh-huh. to Minneapolis for a year. Then St. Louis, and now I bop all over the place. But right, great town, great hometown too. Yeah, it, it is. It's a great hometown, and I'm really hoping that they uh, they come up with the out of out of the box solution that's going to revive Detroit. It's really sad yes. what's happened there. It can happen anywhere, is the thing. And um, I think I also, you know, I also hope they come up with a solution to revive the Detroit Lions. Oh yeah. So. Now, that's a miracle. That could be one of the miracles hmm. of 2012. Yeah, the, uh, yeah <laughs> the, it, it probably could be. You know, as we approach 2012, and, I, you know, everybody has a theory, William. Everybody has mm-hmm. a theory. I also still think, though, there's going to be some kind of solar event, some kind of tie-in to the sun, uh, you know, maybe an X-flare. You know, that's what I've said. I've gone on record as saying that. I think the Mayans were adept at astronomy. Something's going on there. Would you would you consider possibly that too? Oh, this goes to what we were saying just before the break, George, about the sun, Inri, being a source of a vibration, and of mm-hmm. course, the idea is that it's it emanates from the center of the Milky Way galaxy and then gets stepped down through our sun. And so, I totally agree with you that any kind of 
vibration, solar flare, something like that activity would, on one level, could be disastrous. But yet, on another level, it could be an opportunity for us to to bathe ourselves in this higher vibration or higher frequency if we're so prepared. If we're not, as I said, it's going to be a bad hair day, and it could certainly be a bad hair day, technologically speaking. But at the spiritual level, I do believe the ancients are telling us you want to become one with the sun. The sun is the way and the truth and the light. The way to heaven is through the sun, and the sun is the gate or sun tunnel or star tunnel that links us to the center of the galaxy. And in my Soul Rising presentation, I spent a lot of time on the idea of Pentecost, which is really fascinating, George, because the Christian images of Pentecost, which happened 50 days after Jesus' ascension, you see this fire frequency or vibration coming down from the heavenly realms, probably the center of the galaxy, symbolized by the dove, often a radiant dove, entering into the crown or crown chakras of the disciples who are gathered in the upper room. And it shows them with flames coming out of the top of their heads. And I look at this and say, well, these Christian depictions of Pentecost, of this higher energy of the Holy Spirit, this cosmic energy coming through the sun or from the sun, Jesus, in the Christian perspective, these depictions exactly match what the ancient Egyptians were showing when Echinaten and Nefertiti were aligned up with the Aton disk, the light that illuminates the sun. And we know for a fact that the Essenes were huge uh, researchers of the, the revelation of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, and I believe what they possessed, George, was a technique, a spiritual technology that opened their consciousness to this higher frequency or vibration coming from the center of the galaxy that was, is called the Holy Spirit, is symbolized by the dove, but is in fact a cosmic energy that can awaken our consciousness if we're attuned to it. Mary. John the, not John the Baptist, but, but the brother of Jesus, James, Mary Magdalene, Jesus' other family members, were these disciples gathered in the upper room who knew how to do this. And this is something I'm attempting to find out is what was it that they did? How did he attune their consciousness so that they could receive this fire frequency or vibration called the Holy Spirit? All right, back to the phones we go. First time caller, Wesley, truck driving in Texas. You're up. Hey, Wesley, go ahead. Hey, what's up? Hi, good to have you with. Turn your radio down and go ahead. Yeah, I just did. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, uh, make a long story short, George. Um, I called here a while back. Uh, uh, me and my father was on the uh, going down an old country road, and I called about. I was asking. You had two ladies guests in there, and I believe they were talking about magic or something like that. Okay. And uh, I'm sure you've slept since then. But just to just to give William, you know, touch base with him. Uh, real fast in a hurry, uh, we were going down the road, and it looked like a car was on the side of the road. It looked like two headlights were really, 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 really bright. And the closer we got to it, the brighter it was. But when we finally got up on it, it, it was on a bridge, and it was two things glowing like light bulbs, exactly like you explained it. And that is the first time I've ever heard anybody. I can picture it in my mind, and it just gives me chills. It was so It was beautiful. They're scary at the same time. Like when people, you know, when they say, you know, shadow people, I see shadow people, they're six feet tall and they have like a veil on them. Well, that's what it looked like. It looked like a person with a veil, like a robe type form, but they were glowing. And that's wow. the first time I've ever heard anybody say that, you know. So I was wondering, you, you uh, the question I had for you is, I have two questions for you. One is about the picture. I believe you said that you had, a, somebody had like a, a, a Kodak picture, I was wondering if there's any way that you could put that up somewhere so I could look at it to kind of visualize to see if that's what I saw. And my other question for you is kind of like the shadow people, you know, they say shadow people feed off of negative energy like fighting and stuff like that. Well, what would, what would the uh, glowing people, I guess you could say, or the rainbow effect,